facts in the post-truth era, um, well, facts are just fine. We don't have to worry about them. They are there whether we like it or not, but we do have to worry about us and our relationship with facts, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. So this was the word of the year 2017, post-truth. Um, but it's not completely clear what it might mean. Truth is there, of course, still. Uh, what is it that's posed? Here's how it's defined. It's the idea that objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than emotions and personal belief. It's not a very good definition, as we shall see, but you get the general idea that somehow we are not believing in accordance with how the world is, but in accordance with our emotions and all sorts of uh, general uh, personal belief. And of course, this has its manifestations. We know about a few of those. We have the fake news. Right after the uh, big fire at the uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, the fire wasn't out before the fake news was out. Um, here were three of them that the Islamist extremists caused the fire, that a mosque would be built afterwards, and even that uh, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, you know, the, he was then the candidate to be president in the Ukraine. He had set the fire. So it's very creative. We have also, of course, uh, conspiracy theories are being uh, spread more than ever. Um, and uh, this, of course, is the theory that we never went to the moon, that it was all a conspiracy. Um, when I looked last, I think 11% of the US population believes in that. But it's not just the Americans, Swedes, I think about 6%. I'm from Sweden. Um, and of course, we even have the Flat Earth Society having a boom right now. That one can giggle at, but it's not so funny when one thinks about some of the other uh, manifestations of this, such as climate denial. Um, people often ask me, is there more knowledge resistance now than before? We don't have numbers on that. But we do know that certain types of science denial is getting a lot of spread, such as climate denial. And of course, some of the climate deniers have a lot of power. <laughs> they are precedent. So. Um, and then there is, of course, this, which is the anti-vaxxers. Um, the World Health Organization listed uh, vaccine hesitancy or vaccine denial as uh, one of the top 10 threats to world health 2019. It's not just um, measles. We've heard a lot about measles in Europe and the US because it's spreading like crazy. During the 2017, it had a 300% increase. It continued like that during 2018, and now it's double the speed. But it's also other vaccines. So it's pretty serious stuff. And then we have this, which is uh, by Dan Kayan, a political scientist, being called fact polarization. If people polarize according to political views. That's OK. We have different values. But now we have a situation where, depending on which political group we belong to, we believe in different facts than the other group. And that's what he calls fact polarization. And he suggests that people who used to be divided over the relative weight of liberty and equality are less sharply divided today over the justice of progressive taxation, the classical kind of political value issue, than over the evidence that human carbon dioxide emissions are driving up global temperatures. So that's a really strange situation. So what I want to do today is try to provide some tools for understanding what's going on. I think it's a very complex situation. But I think there are at least three components in this that one has to understand. And uh, so before the break, up until the break, I will sort of talk about what's setting this up. And then after the break, I hope to get a little more kind of constructive. But I, I want to say at the outset, it's a very complex problem. And no one should think, oh, well, I will talk about that. A little bit of critical thinking will solve it. No, I won't. So here's my plan. I will talk a little bit first about what I call epistemic vulnerabilities, reasons why the sort of nature of knowledge itself makes us vulnerable. And then I want to talk about our psychological vulnerabilities. And then, of course, how this interacts with the new technology and the disinformation situation we're in, because it is this interaction between these three components. This sounds maybe strange, epistemic vulnerabilities, but I think there are such. Um, sometimes it's said, I mean, I just want to put one thing to the side, because there's one type of debate where um, people who doubt science do it because they don't trust the scientific method. They don't believe in the scientific method. I think there are other ways of getting knowledge through, uh, you know, um, faith or um, intuition or something like that. 
And, and Michael Lynch, an American philosopher who's talked a lot about post-truth, he talks about this a lot, and he's quite right to point out that this, of course, is a very big problem. If people don't believe in scientific method, then what do you do? How do you sort of bootstrap yourself and argue for the scientific method? I'm going to put that problem to the side because I don't think it's central to this. I think it's central to other things like creationism in the U.S. and so on. But I think here we have something else going on. Because, indeed, much of science denial is driven by the scientific sort of attitudes. People are be, want to be very scientific. They really want to find truth. And then they go about it in this strange way. Here's a nice example. After the Notre Dame fire, uh, people were spreading this hoax that the Muslims set, set the, the whole thing on fire. Um, and to prove that, they were doing these experiments where they were trying to put fire to oak by using this flame sort of uh, flowers, right? And they were proving, showing that it's really, really hard to do this. So it couldn't possibly be that the fire started by itself. That's a very scientific attitude, right? We'll get back to whether it does, why it's not a good argument, but it's, it's not unscientific. So this was being spread on Facebook. So what is it about the nature of knowledge that makes this so hard? I want to make a couple of points here, and I'm going to do it by using the traditional philosophical definition of knowledge. Most of you may have heard it. It's ancient. It goes back to Plato. It's pretty much a starting point for contemporary philosophy, even though people sort of discuss the details. In particular, they discuss whether these three conditions are sufficient, but let's not worry about that because they're necessary, and that's all we need to make the points I want to make today. So to know something, to know that the Earth is round, you have to at least believe it. If you don't do that, you have no knowledge. So the flat earthers don't know it. But you can't just believe it because you could believe something very strongly that's false and you don't have knowledge. So it has to be true. But that's not enough either. And already Plato pointed that out because here's your belief. It has to be true, somehow connected with reality. But that's not enough. There has to be some relationship between you and the truth. That is to say, it has to be not just a lucky guess. You need some kind of evidence grounds, reasons for your belief for it to be knowledge. And it's when it comes to this third point that things get tricky with knowledge resistance, and I'll spell that out in a second. Let me just say one thing about truth. It's a property of what we say or what we believe. So if I say the earth is flat, this statement has it or it doesn't have it. There are lots of philosophical theories about truth that I won't talk about here. What I consider serious theories take truth to be objective in this sense, that whether or not what I say has this property is not determined by what I think about the matter. If I think it's true, it doesn't make it true. Or if all of you think it's true, that doesn't make it true. Or if the entire world thinks it's true, that doesn't make it true. So there is this potential gap between our beliefs and truth, and that we just have to live with. Now, Sometimes people get angry at me when I say the truth is objective because they say, how very dogmatic of you. You're so dogmatic. And then I say, no, it's the other way around. It's precisely because truth is objective that we have to be undogmatic and humble because it shows, it means that we may be wrong. It's very easy to be wrong, precisely because this property, truth, is not up to us. We may be wrong. That means I should listen to objections. I should be open to the possibility that I'm wrong and listen to other people. If truth were subjective, there would be no reason for me to listen to other people. That's just the point I want to make. Now, evidence. I said that what gets us into trouble is evidence. So let me say a few things about that. Now, if you think about how do you know that you're sitting here listening to some Swede talking about knowledge resistance? Well, you sort of see it, hear it, you read it in the program, you experience it. Most of the things we know in our daily life when we sort of uh, <clears throat> get around in the world, of course, comes from our experiences, from what we see and feel and hear and so on. That's a very important source of knowledge. And we have that in common with the animals. That's how we orient ourselves in the world. However, we also have another very important source of knowledge, unlike the animals, other people who know more. And this is what philosophers call testimonial knowledge, because it comes from linguistic testimony. I can find out about the world by going to other people, going to sources, and getting knowledge that way. This is an amazing thing about human beings. We have this division of cognitive labor. Each of us collect knowledge 
through our lives that we then can spread through language to other individuals that then is spread from generation to generation. We have a knowledge accumulation. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.